We have Petrion, who as I call him, you can call him Peter, it's okay, uh, with Theo Player. Um, he's a longtime regular of Discovery Track and a streaming media east. We all know him well, and here he is going to talk about DRM and content protection, something anyone with valuable content needs to know about. And afterwards, many of you, maybe all of you, will get these lovely gold notebooks, uh, which we guess first come, first serve. All right, take it away, Petrion. Yeah, thank you for uh, the introduction, Troy. Um, so yeah, indeed, today, uh, a little bit of a topic um, which a lot of our customers are, are facing, of course, um, being they have premium content and they have to ensure that, well, on one side, of course, the, the rights managers get what they want. Because, um, of course, if you've followed uh, the news over the last number of years, um, you, will, you will know that most of the uh, big content producers, they basically all got hit. Um, by some form of, of content privacy, uh, piracy. Um, and it's, it's a growing trend. Um, it's, it's happening more and more, and impact is, can be fa fairly big if you didn't anticipate uh, what could happen. Um, so that's more or less um, what I wanted to sketch here. A number of ways to anticipate it, uh, a number of ways to prevent it, um, and of course, a number of ways to just avoid um, facing this kind of issues uh, in general. Um, and of course, uh, a first interesting thing uh, to look at is why do people do it? Why do people pirate content? Um, and of course, the most logical solution usually is, well, they can earn money out of it. Um, so that's, that's one reason. Um, so you do have pirates selling uh, pirated content or offering it on illegal streaming websites with advertising and then making money that way. Um, but sometimes it's something completely different. Um, just being able to brag that you have, I don't know, the, the latest episode of Game of Thrones or, or something similar. Um, or it could be, for example, for other reasons like political reasons or just to get revenge um, on a studio or on someone who made a decision that you did not like, um, which has happened as well uh, over the past few years. Um, and of course, you also have the other side uh, next to, of course, the, the pirates, as a lot of people call them. Um, you also have the people who are actually watching that pirated content. So the question is, why do they do it? Um, of course, again, money comes into the picture because um, some people are like, yeah, it's free. It's another reason is it's easy to use. Um, sometimes it's easier to use than the paid alternatives, which is a little bit bad. Uh, in my opinion, um, or of course they don't know alternatives or the alternatives which are legally available in their country don't have access to the content um, that they would want to see or not, not at the same time uh, when they would want to see it. Um, so those are, those are definitely a number of things um, which we see for our customers um, that are the reasons why their content is pirated and why people are watching pirated content. Um, but uh, a little bit of bad news, uh, you can almost not stop content piracy. Um, if you really are going to try it, it's going to be massively expensive, um, and it's going to be like stopping crime. I mean, you can do a very good attempt, and you can go very far, but stopping it completely, if you would ask me, is going to be more or less impossible to do. Um, so let's see what is reasonable, because um, there's a lot of pretty good things that you can do. Because um, there are a lot of ways how content is being pirated. Um, one of the older ones, some people might remember this. Um, I'm a little bit older than I look, so I still remember this as well. Um, just making illegal copies. Um, that's something that's been going on for a very long time. Um, it happened with cassette tapes, it happened with DVDs, it happened in music with CDs. Um, and well, now it's even easier, just copy it and download it uh, on your hard drive. Um, so definitely, definitely one of the important ones. Um, of course, a second one, um, some people don't think of it as content piracy, but it's definitely as bad if your scripts leak or if certain seasons um, of popular TV shows like Orange is the New Black, uh, when they leak. Um, major hacking incidents, um, definitely something to, to take into account, um, probably for a different level of, uh, of people in the media industry, um, but still very, very relevant. Um, or another one which is uh, very common uh, for, a certain of customer, for a certain number of customers of ours, 
um, rebroadcasting of their sports events, for example. Um, and well, a lot of people will probably remember this one as well, um, where the Mayweather fight uh, basically got rebroadcasted on social networks, um, which, well, made it pretty easy to watch, even though there were some other streaming issues on other sites. Um, and another pretty common one, but most people don't think about it uh, because it's usually tolerated, is, for example, account sharing um, and accessing content that you normally shouldn't have access to um, that way. Um, probably something which is fairly common even in this room. Um, an important thing, um, what are you going to do when your content is being pirated? Make sure that you have a plan in place. A big question often is, what are you going to do when it happens? What are you going to do when your content is being stolen? Do you have a mechanism in place to make sure that it stops from happening? Or are you, um, well, did you cover yourself enough uh, so that the person that you bought the rights for is not going to sue you? Um, if we look at the, at the content production life cycle, well, very slimmed down version of it, um, we basically see that there are a number of important steps uh, within, within, uh, within the life cycle. You have, of course, everything that's pre-production. Uh, once it's more or less ready and you go into the, the pre-release phase when you basically stop having to spend all of the money uh, but prepare for the release, uh, at which point you will gain a lot of money. Um, and then, of course, the post-release scenario where, depending on the type of content, the value of that content will actually decrease over time. Um, for example, with sports events, it can decrease fairly fast. Uh, with movies, it decreases a lot uh, slower, but still, the value is going to decrease at that point. And what we actually see, um, or something that we usually recommend to, to our customers as well, is to actually tackle those different states um, with different measures uh, of security. Uh, first one is, of course, prevention, which is very, very important, um, more or less up until the point when you start releasing your content. And then after that, it's, of course, a matter of delaying uh, content piracy as long as possible. Because, of course, as long as you can delay it, that value is just going down anyway. So the amount of money that you would make out of that content is going to reduce um, regardless of, uh, of uh, how the protection actually uh, um, is set up. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned it already. What are you going to do when the problem actually happens? Um, there's a few other things that you have to keep in mind. Um, next to prevention um, and, and other stuff, it's basically detection. Making sure that when content is being pirated, that you know where it's happening, who possibly is the source of the leak, um, so that, of course, you can, you can well, take measures against it. Um, very common things are access logs, using watermarking, uh, personalizing certain video streams, um, like, for example, what happens with the Oscar screeners, um, or, in case necessary, basically calling the police and asking them to help you out. Uh, that's something you can always try to do as well. Um, and, of course, on the other side, once you know that there is a leak and once you potentially know what the source, it's all about damage control. How are you going to make sure that that leak doesn't grow um, or that you can basically reduce uh, the damage that it can do? Um, and there are a number of, uh, number of solutions that you can have there as well. And it's definitely an important part of the plan uh, to have in case that there is a, um, in case that there's a leak uh, of your content. Of course, those things, they're, they're more important uh, for the people actually owning the content rights. Um, so there are, of course, a number of technological measures that you can put into place to deter and to prevent uh, your content from being pirated in the first place. Um, so let's have a, a look at those. And of course, it can be a talk on, on content protection without talking about DRM uh, at one point or another. Um, I assume that most people here know more or less um, how DRM works. Um, but what it basically does is all of your files are stored in an encrypted way. Um, there's a certain key that you can use to decrypt that content and to get access to the original content. But the goal is to keep that key and, well, the decrypted content in general, to get it as far into the hardware as possible and make sure that there's as little 
uh, well, the, the amount of places where people can intercept that raw content is as low as possible. Um, so for more, most DRM solutions uh, these days, uh, it's still software DRM. For 4K and other, um, well, higher quality content, it will probably be required that you will have a hardware DRM as well. Um, and basically, in most cases, if you use DRM, your content will be safe up until the HDMI cable where it basically gets plugged into your TV um, or into a recorder uh, that can record the content still, but then you lose a, you, you have another, uh, a few other downsides there as well. Um, and basically what will happen is if someone will try to just record the screen even um, or capture the content in most ways, they'll basically get a blacked out screen. Um, so they won't be able to capture the raw images. They won't be able to capture the raw source material, uh, which is even more important. Um, so that's, that's basically it. Problem with DRM is, of course, that it's a very expensive solution. Um, sometimes, contractually, you have to go there. Um, sometimes, you don't have to go there. Um, so the question is, of course, what other solutions can there be um, that could potentially solve the problem for you as well? Um, and one thing that we see pretty often um, coming back is actually using stream tokenization. Um, it's a fairly common approach uh, where you basically place a cookie or another form of token and you hand it off to the clients who are able or who should be allowed to access the content. And basically, if that link um, to that uh, video stream is copied, as long as that user um, that opens the copied link doesn't have that software token, um, he cannot see the stream. Um, it's a fairly easy solution to use. Uh, a lot of CDNs and a lot of servers uh, provide it out of the box. Um, so it's also a fairly cheap solution. Um, of course, it's not a full solution. Um, so there are a number of other things uh, which are being used fairly frequently. Um, one is, of course, geo-blocking, uh, which comes in mind, uh, for example, when you will look at sports rights for, rights for the World Cup uh, soccer, uh, which is coming up in the summer. Um, where you basically restrict access to certain geographic areas. If you are a broadcaster and you're targeting, for example, a country in Europe, well, if somebody in South America is going to be accessing your content, it's probably not, uh, well, the access that you would want. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's one approach uh, that's used to protect content as well. It's not the best approach, uh, but again, it can be used in a combination uh, of different approaches. Um, and then another one, um, which is mainly used for identification, um, is of course stream watermarking, um, where if there is a leak, uh, people basically have an individual and personalized stream. Um, so they can, you can basically identify who leaked the source um, and who leaked the actual video. Um, and once you know that, of course, what you can do is you can basically try to shut down that stream for that individual user, um, or you can uh, change resolution or other things uh, to make sure that the people who are watching the pirated content basically get a bad experience um, and hopefully leave uh, or search for alternatives. Um, another pretty good measure, um, and that's basically in the area of prevention, um, so not really when things have happened already, um, is actually to sue people. Um, that might be a strange thing to say, uh, but it creates a lot of public awareness. Um, it happened with BitTorrent, for example. It happened with Popcorn Time. Um, I mean, Popcorn Time is a pretty good example of piracy because it made it so easy. Netflix-like piracy, basically. Um, you just browse through the catalog, you hit go, and it would start playing without any technical knowledge required. But basically, the, the lawsuit that happened there, it took down a big, big chunk of it. Um, and while suing people, it will not undo the damage that has been done. It could prevent uh, people in the future from pirating uh, in similar ways again. Um, and of course, I mean, the, well, some people would refer to as a real pirates. They won't get scared of it. Um, but some other people, well, they might get scared of it. Um, of course, do use this with a little bit of caution as well, because uh, we don't want to go back into the MP3 era where people would get sued for millions of dollars for sharing one single MP3 file, which was a little bit ridiculous. Um, another one, which is 
very frequently forgotten and which, if you would ask me, is actually the most important one on this list. Um, it actually comes back to the list that I showed in the beginning. Why do people actually watch pirated content? And a big reason there is because it's either easier or the experience is better. And you can basically um, get rid of that argument by making sure that you build a connection with your viewers. Make sure that you deliver a compelling user experience, that you build that relationship, and that you make sure that whatever those pirated websites or that pirated content is offering, that you basically build that relationship with your subscribers or with your viewers so that they will just come back because it's an easy solution for them. And well, hopefully, if the pricing model is more or less OK as well, they will come back. Um, it's something that we've seen with a number of customers um, where they basically changed user experience and saw the number of, uh, of uh, videos being pirated from their platforms significantly drop as well. Um, of course, that's more or less what we do as well. So if you have any questions about that, um, we're of course a player company and we work with some of the pretty big uh, companies out there, um, helping them protect their content, um, helping them build compelling user experiences uh, to make sure that their viewers are happy and they don't have to um, go to pirated content. And that's it. So if there are any questions, I'm open for it. Who's got a question for Petrion? I'm trying so hard. Petrion. It's pretty good pronunciation. I'm trying. All right. Um, you guys can't have your lunch break unless somebody asks them a question. So who's going to ask a question? Oh, uh, I guess. They're fading. All right. Uh, all set then? All set. Going once, going twice. OK, everybody, we have a nice long break. We'll see you back here at 1.45. Please come up and get a handy, helpful, beautiful gold notebook. And first, a big round of applause for Petrion, a Theo player. Thank you. Keep your content safe. See you at 145.